This video is a complete summary of all canon subject matter towards the series in question. It contains spoilers and details for numerous aspects to the story and its events, and is not meant to serve as a replacement to experiencing any of the pieces of media mentioned. Please support the official releases of the developers and their entries in the franchise. The Star Fisher is one of, if not the most mysterious anomaly in the Mist universe. As Atrus observed when he briefly fell in, it appeared similar to outer space. However, he felt wind and an active current pushing him within, as well as a presumably breathable environment. Its origin is truly unknown. Gen believed it a result of Atrus and Catherine altering Riven's age during their escape. Catherine believed it to be an act of the Maker, to serve a greater purpose. It is likely that the Expanse is a representation of the space between ages, the space that is traversed whenever a link is taken with a book. Of course, linking is so fast that a traveler will have no idea what it's traversing, so this might be thought of as a sort of dark matter between the ages of this vast multiverse, as if the fissure was a tear, allowing access to the space in between. Normally, I would steer away from speculation, especially when it comes from my own personal opinions. But with something both as mysterious and integral as the Star Fisher, I'm going to try and fill in some gaps present. It was observed both by Gen and briefly by Atrus that there is a sort of current within the Expanse. Atrus even noted that for the brief period he fell into the fissure, he could feel a sort of flow pulling a certain way, like a river. I would like to propose that currents within the Expanse are formed as a result of a flowing force between two rifts that have opened between ages, almost like the Expanse, even in this most brute force of ways, encourages linking. It's unknown how, or if, a second fissure was created. If it was, it might have been written into Dunny by the Guild of Writers of old, foreseeing any accidental fissure creation in distant ages, and if someone were to fall through. While Dunny likely didn't know everything about the Expanse, they might have been aware of some of its properties. If someone was exploring an age and caused a star fissure and fell in, they needed a means of escape. Thus, another opening on Dunny might have been written in that would appear for any traveler lost in the Expanse, giving them an exit. But where on Dunny? Putting it underground in the cavern was too risky. It needed to be large, but it was observed that these could be prone to absorbing its surroundings. Seemingly, if written purposefully, they could be put anywhere, even midair. Thus, it was to be put a few feet above the surface of Earth, right above the civilization of Dunny. And so when Atrus fell into the fissure on Riven and warped away, his mist book kept falling through the fissure toward a seemingly empty point until suddenly the fissure opened once more, allowing the book through. It fell to the ground, only a few hundred feet from Tiana's old home on the cleft in the middle of 1770's New Spain present-day Eddy's County, New Mexico. Here the book lay undiscovered for over 30 years. While the explanation for this journey is, again, mostly speculative, the takeaway here is that the Mist book did make its way through the Starfisher on Riven, through the Expanse, and to the surface of Earth. That much is clear. Eventually, after these decades had passed, the book was found by a stranger exploring the area around the cleft. There they found the book and returned to their campsite. The book had a single word on the cover. Mist. Flipping through the book, they read a summary of a fascinating island with unique buildings, devices, and other books. It kept them busy all night until the book was finished. The stranger was satisfied, but still curious about the first page of the book, which appeared as a black panel. However, after staring for only a few seconds, the blackness shifted to a sea 
that appeared to be moving, which would eventually pan upward to see an island in the distance. That was it! Mist Island! It looked so real in this impossible panel, almost as if the stranger could just reach out and touch it. Suddenly, the stranger was warped to the docks of Mist Island with nothing but the clothes on their back. The stranger's identity has never been formally revealed by Cyan Worlds, or anyone else for that matter. Given the location of the book and the real-life time frame, it's possible that the stranger is of either Native American descent, like the Ahmad, or potentially of Spanish-Mexican descent. However, they have been shown to read and understand English, Atris's first language taught to him by Tiana, and thus how he wrote his journals. While possible, this was an exceedingly rare trait amongst the aforementioned groups. A somewhat popular fan theory is that this was a traveler who was along for the Lewis and Clark expedition and became lost on the return trip, eventually wandering to what is today the southwestern US. While a bit outlandish, it does match up decently with the time frame. None of these theories really matter though, as at the end of the day, the stranger is, and was always intended to be, you, the player. The Stranger is essentially the only aspect of the universe to which the developers don't go out of their way to provide an explanation. Instead, any traces of the Stranger's identity is left purposefully ambiguous to serve as a nice self-insert. The character is a silent protagonist, entries featuring the Stranger are always first person where no traits of the character can be seen, and the character is referred to with they-them pronouns or with general descriptions such as the Traveler or simply my friend. For the sake of consistency, the character will continue to be referred to as The Stranger from here on. Upon composing themselves, The Stranger explores the island and its mysterious fixtures, all abandoned. Many appear to be blocked off by various codes and puzzles. Eventually, they stumble upon Atris's message informing Catherine of the betrayal of at least one of their sons, along with the burning of the books in their library. He mentions that he's hidden a few of these linking books before leaving, along with small hints as to where to find them on the island. From there, the stranger decides to investigate the library, where they do confirm that most of the books have indeed been burned, though some of Atris's journals still remained, giving insight as to his adventures on some of these ages. Also in the library, the stranger finds the red and blue books to Spire and Haven. Upon opening them, they found a linking panel, similar to the one on the Mist book, However, this one didn't give an image, it was all static and noise, until they noticed a red and blue page next to their respective books, and when placed inside these strange bound books, the page seemed to merge back with its companions, as if it was never removed. Suddenly, a figure appeared. In their respective ages, Cirrus and Akinar noticed the opening of the book and could barely mention anything through the static, but could convey a request. They asked the stranger to bring more red or blue pages, hidden across mist, or potentially on other ages. Without much of a lead, and needing more information, the stranger decided to search and eventually uncover the hiding places for the hidden ages of Atris. These included Mechanical, Channelwood, Salentic, and Stoneship. Here they found homes wrecked with no natives, and could see traces of devastation from both brothers. It appeared that Atris had hidden a red and blue page in each of the ages, which the stranger could find using hints in Atris's journals along with their own ingenuity. Each time a page was returned to the red and blue books, the static would dissipate a bit more, and the brothers would give a bit more information. Essentially, each tried to blame the other brother for the misdeeds of other ages, including the destruction of the library, as well as the imprisonment of the other brother and their father. They both insisted on their own innocence, and that the righteous thing to do would be to free them. Eventually, the stranger was starting to catch on that both of these brothers were to blame, and that they really couldn't trust either of them. Unfortunately, they had no other options at the moment and decided to be cautious as they continued searching for pages. Finally, the two brothers were extremely clear in the panel and they both said they needed only one more page to be able to leave. However, all accessible ages were searched, including Mist Island itself. What else could the stranger have missed? 
The brothers both realized, of course, the secret alcove in the library, hidden behind the fireplace. Atrus put numerous secret items in the alcove. It must be there. But wait, the brothers thought. They also remembered what they themselves had put in the hidden chamber. They both separately gave the stranger the access code to get behind the fireplace, asking to retrieve the last page. But if they find a book with a green cover, do not open it. They both made up a lie of it being another prison book created by the other brother. The stranger left, found the proper code, and uncovered the secret alcove, where they found both pages, along with what was likely the book the brothers spoke of. The stranger felt they couldn't choose a page. They both were so untrustworthy that they decided to pick the middle route. They opened the green book and saw a linking panel with images slowly forming. Eventually a man, writing in a large tome behind a desk in a cave, could be made out. Atrus noticed he was being watched and called out to the stranger, asking who they were, but immediately following up by telling them not to link through yet. Instead, Atrus asked the stranger to find a missing page to a missed linking book, giving them a few places it might be. The stranger would find the page hidden in a switch near the dock that the stranger first arrived at. With the page in hand, Atrus asked the stranger to finally warp through the green book, where the stranger found himself in Kavir with Atrus. Upon handing over the page, Atrus was quickly able to repair his missed linking book, freeing him and now the stranger as well from Kavir. Atrus immediately goes back to Mist and burns the linking books to Spire and Haven, keeping their descriptive books locked away. Upon return, he talks a bit with the stranger. The stranger talks about all that had occurred. Atrus laments that he cannot provide much of a reward for freeing him, besides free access to his ages. It does occur to Atrus that he might finally have a proxy to send to Riven, however, and mentions that he might be able to help with the stranger returning home, if they can help him again when the time comes. Over the next few months, the stranger was introduced to Rhyme, and Atrus would work to continue fortifying Riven, as well as observing the situation from Rhyme's crystal viewer. The situation was dire. Riven was still unstable, both in its society and in its physical foundation. After around four or five months, Atrus was ready to put his plan into place. He had finished writing another prison book, similar to the ones holding his sons. This one, however, was meant for Gen. He needed to sustain Riven as long as possible, so we asked the stranger to make their way to Riven in his stead, while Atrus continued writing. Armed with the prison book and Atrus's personal notes on the age, the stranger was given two objectives, to trap Gen and to free Catherine. Afterwards, find a means to signal Atrus, so that he may arrive with a means of escape. At risk of capture, the stranger couldn't go to Riven with a linking book. The two also discussed the Star Fisher, a means of returning to Earth, potentially. Given that Atrus was able to deduce this was the destination of the passage, seeing as that's how his missed book ended its journey on the stranger's home. Upon arrival on Riven, Gen still had the entry point guarded. Of course, no one had come through the link in roughly a year since Catherine. The station guard was about to doze off, expecting no one to arrive just like any other day, until the stranger arrived at the entry point, which had a small structure built by Gen around it. This was actually a cage with a pressure plate that when someone linked in, the plate would trigger, causing bars to raise and trap them. This happened to the stranger, and the guard monitoring the station was awoken from their half-slumber and motioned over to the stranger. Following the procedure given, the guard was told to immediately search for any linking books on the person if one was to arrive. He noticed the prison book, and despite some resistance, he is able to force it off the stranger's person. He starts to read through it a bit before collapsing to the ground. He had been hit by a poison dart from someone just outside of the stranger's view. Two assailants appear, Moiety rebels who had been monitoring the station from a distance, and grab the prison book off the guard and drag the body away. 
Meanwhile, they pull a lever, dropping the cage and jamming the mechanism, essentially breaking operation of the cage bars. By the time the stranger leaves the cage, the two rebels are gone, with the stranger noticing the guard's body having been thrown off a nearby cliff. Now, a third objective had presented itself to the stranger. Get the prison book back. The stranger started to explore the island that they had arrived on, one of the five islands that Riven had been broken up into. This one was dubbed simply as Temple Island by Gen, after the many places of worship that were constructed for him. In Rivenese, the natives called it Ayapo, meaning water pool, after the lake in the center which was used for power. The rebels started calling it Ayatwan, meaning pool of stars, named after the star fissure which was formed under the island. Via Maglev Tram, the stranger made their way to what Gen called Jungle Island, where most of the current natives of Riven lived, mostly in fear of Gen. Because virtually all of the Rivenese lived here, this island was simply dubbed Riven by the natives. Here, most of the Rivenese would hide from the stranger as they explored, looking for clues as to the whereabouts of the rebels. Eventually, the stranger makes their way to two more of the islands, Book Assembly Island and Survey Island. The villagers had no names for these as they were only visited by Gen and some hand-picked guards and scribes. Here, the stranger found that this was where Gen did most of his experimenting and observing of both Riven and the art. Gen was nowhere to be found, but his journal was. The stranger read about how Catherine is being held on the final, smallest island, simply called Prison Island. This island was formerly where Riven's great tree was before it was cut for paper, to be used in books. Then it was turned into a private office for Gen until finally being made into a prison. Gen was likely on the 233rd age, which the stranger read about in Gen's journal. Eventually, the stranger was able to find enough clues to locate the hideout of the rebels, a renovated cell in one of Gen's prisons. Here, the stranger could find a hidden linking book to Tay. The stranger linked and found himself on a cove on the outside of a circular canyon with a large tree stump and nest on the center island. Almost immediately, the stranger was hit by a tranquilizer dart and knocked out. The two rebels had hit them and dragged them on a boat to take them to the nest where most of those living on Tay resided. The stranger awoke in a room with a journal written by Catherine, which the stranger read to catch up on her actions since leaving Mist. Eventually, one of Catherine's friends, Nayla, arrived. Nayla arrived with the prison book that she convinced the guards to give her, as well as a linking book, back to Riven. Finally, the stranger had the prison book back, and now needed to look for Gen. The 233rd age, even as small as it was, required its books to be powered by marble domes all across Riven. This was a result of Gen's ineptitude with the art. Cracking the code to unlock the domes meant having immense knowledge of Riven's geography and power sources. Undeterred, the stranger was able to use their collection and research of Riven to activate the books and make their way to Gen's hidden age. There, similar to Riven itself, Gen had rigged a cage that would trigger when someone arrived. Not long after the stranger was trapped in the cage, Gen returned to the single building on the age. He explained in his calm tone the nature of who he was and his relation to Atris. He takes the prison book from the stranger and analyzes it. Similar to the books used to imprison Atris's sons, this book gave a false view of what it appeared to be to an observer though this time it appeared as if it was a linking book to Dunny. It had seemed that Gen was fooled for a moment, but realized this was too easy. The stranger was a bit frustrated until he heard Gen's request. In order to prove the authenticity of the book, he insisted the stranger link first. Suddenly, everything about how and why the prison books were designed made sense. It was a gamble, but the stranger took it, and linked using the prison book. The stranger observed a barren age, unlike the promised Dunny in the book, and anxiously awaited a few moments, until finally, Gen trusted the Link himself and went through. By Atrus's design, the stranger was forced to link back through to the 233rd age, leaving Gen 
trapped in the prison book. The stranger was able to escape the trap in the 233rd age and began exploring Gen's private collection and chambers. They discovered a journal of his and began learning about the last few years of Gen's life. Following this, they discovered an arbitrary combination of sounds that Gen had by his bedside. Finally, there were five linking books, each leading to a different island of Riven. Here, the stranger knew what must be done. This was their chance to access the isolated last island, the prison island where Catherine was being held. Here, the stranger used the combination on Gen's bedside to open the cage and free the imprisoned Catherine. She was relieved to see an ally of Atrus's, and even more so to see that Gen was finally captured. She told the stranger to go plan a signal for Atrus, while she would inform the Rivenese of Gen's imprisonment and help them escape to Tay. Riven's time was extremely short now. It was beginning to collapse. The two separated, and the stranger needed to think of a way to change the age enough so Atrus would notice it. And also, the stranger was starting to think about how they could make their way home now with their missions completed. Might as well tackle both at the same time. The stranger headed back to the point of entry in Riven, which was near where the star fissure had been covered, mostly by iron and rock, with a small glass window. Here there was a telescope above it, used to observe the anomaly. Catherine had written the combination to the glass casing in her journal. After inputting the code, the glass was now accessible. The stranger proceeded to remove locks on the telescope, causing it to plummet into the window and crack it. The crack grew until the ground itself separated, revealing the star fissure once more. Riven had begun to fall apart, and Atrus absolutely saw this happening. The stranger saw the link point activate, and Atrus had arrived instantly running towards the stranger. He asked about Catherine and the prison book, and before the stranger could answer, Catherine arrived and the two embraced. She happily showed the book with Gen trapped, and informed the two that Riven had been evacuated. The only ones left were the three of them. Atrus presented his mislinking book to Catherine, which she uses, and Atrus prepares to follow, but not before Atrus says his goodbyes and thanks to the stranger, expressing hope they will meet again, leaving with the reminder that they know where to find him. He warps, leaving the mist book to fall into the star fissure, and the stranger feels the ground below them crack as they let themselves fall into the fissure as well. The stranger and mist book continue to fall in the starry expanse until they finally reach the other rift leading back to the cleft, the stranger's home, Earth. It wasn't long after the events on Riven that Atrus and Catherine realized that they were only being reminded of bad memories on Mist Island. Tiana and their children were gone, and they wanted an opportunity to start fresh. Atrus worked on building a home on the surface of Earth. Together they traveled to an area that Atrus had found from observing Dunny, which he dubbed Tomana. It was in the general area of the cleft, but more of a fertile canyon with water and the potential for vegetation. Here they built their new home in the valley. After moving their belongings, including all their books, to Tomana, Atrus once again continued to work on his writing. He wrote an age titled Averon, which was his first age since Narayan to include native inhabitants. Soon, Atrus started to reflect on his family, most of which had become lost. He needed a new goal, something to pay tribute to what he wanted the future of his family to witness. He decided to, in a sense, carry out his father's goal of rebuilding Dunny, but this time ethically and with proper guidance and structure. He wanted to start by grouping as many Dunny survivors as he could find, and thus this required expeditions to the ruins of Dunny. He employed the help of those in Averone to start excavating and unearthing the secrets of Dunny. The first step of course being to free the blocked passages that separated Kavir from the rest of Dunny. At this point, no portion of Dunny was toxic, but it was absolutely abandoned. The priority was looking for intact linking books with stable ages, places the Dunny could have fled to during the fall and stayed after the fact. Atrus's helpers from Averon were excited and enthusiastic, and Atrus is able to look through Gen's journal from the 233rd age to learn of Dunny legends that might help their research. Atrus and his team find some ages, and Atrus is able to gather some survivors and even followers. Eventually, they begin construction on the ruins of the fallen city. 
the population of the colony in Dunny grows to about 1,200 before a mysterious linking book is discovered inside a fortified room. A Dunny survivor, Tergan, encourages Atris to leave the books be, but eventually he decides to investigate anyway, and the book is retrieved. Atris discovered the book to be Terani, an age where a majority of the Rone fled during the fall of Gartane. Atris knew not much beyond that from the books that held stories of the age. He, Catherine, and some followers traveled to the world and were greeted by an immensely beautiful world of Rone descendants. While the grammar and accents were very different, the language barrier wasn't too great even after thousands of years. Atris is guided by the friendly escort Idra. The travelers are quickly welcomed by aristocrats of the age and Atris immediately is given a tour as he starts telling them about his people and the age of Dunny. He is exceedingly impressed by the society, and it isn't long before he asks if Terranik can simply take in the Dunny survivors, which would be easier and safer than rebuilding the old city. The Rone natives are quick to agree, and it seems like this would be a wonderful idea. However, Atris starts to harbor doubt when he realizes that the values of the old writers and kings of the Rone have lasted into present day Terrani. He witnesses a class system. The Rone aristocrats are harshly separated by a slave class that constructed all of the architectural and technological feats of the age. Between them is an intermediate class of overseers the aristocrats use to keep checks on the slaves. Those of Terrani believe those not of their race's blood who could not write books were inferior. An angered Atris speaks out to the king of Terrani, describing the mixed blood of himself and the lack of either Dane or Rone blood in his wife, both of whom could write. Idra speaks of his compassion for the slaves, but only a few share his belief, and as a result he cannot speak out against the king. Atris spends weeks thinking of the best course of action to take, when suddenly the decision gets taken out of his own hands. An invasive bacterium brought to Terrani from Dunny starts to spread amongst their populace. A bacterium that was unnoticeable to Dunny, as it was harmless to humans, and the native Dunny populace grew resistance to it. The countryside of Terrani quickly falls into chaos. The only people that were saved were those that the Dunny were able to quarantine and care for, which mostly included the slave population. Most of the population of Terrani were wiped out, including all of the upper class Rone. At this time, Atris saw this opportunity to meet with Gat, who was the leader of the slaves, now freed after the death of their captors. Many intermediates who also survived attempted to claim power, but Gat and Atris sent an army led by the militant Ymir to counter them. They succeeded, but Ymir quickly declared himself dictator of the new Terrani. Atris and Gat planned a diplomatic way to take him down but Numur was quickly assassinated by his own subjugated servants. Atris and Gat agreed it was best to leave Terrani, to seal it and let the past die, as the Dunny returned to Earth, and Atris promised the slaves a home in either Dunny or other ages for them to be truly free. The whole Terrani debacle caused Atris to reflect. Perhaps he should take letting the past die even further. His people's history were stained with misfortune and at times malice. He wanted his people to be defined by the future they chose to create, and not the ruins of a legacy left behind. And so, Atris did what he did best. He wrote. He wanted to do as his distant ancestor, Rinareth, had done, and created a new age for his people to call their own. One where they wouldn't be bound to their past, but could start fresh as new people salvaged from the old. Atris would spend the next seven years writing what would become Relishan, meaning the whole in Dunny. Over time, Atris began looking towards past works for inspiration. One was the Age of Jananin, which along with its companion ages were used for training the fundamentals of age building to his sons. He traveled there to seek inspiration for the current age. He of course expected there to be no one else on this abandoned age. He was unfortunately wrong. Nearly 20 years earlier, Cirrus and Akinar had left Savedro to die amidst a bonfire. Savedro, however, was able to escape his immediate bindings and his death sentence. He was of course unable to chase the brothers, however, as they had left the mist book burning in the fire. 
Saavedra was an intelligent scholar and was able to figure out the tests meant for the sons on Jnanin, Voltaic, Amateria, and Adana. Eventually, he made his way back to Narayan, however he could only get to the linking point which was separated on a floating island, encased around an ice-like shield, through which he could only barely make out the other islands of his home, and was convinced it was desolate and his family was gone. He made his way back to Jnanin, and now with his family gone, combined with his exile, he was driven mad. On Jananin, there was a small ravine with a thick fog that Saavedra realized was hallucinogenic and became easy to lose one's mind. In his despair, Saavedra gave in to the fog and lost himself. Over time, he forgot who he even was. And for over a decade, Saavedra spent his days lying in the fog in Jananin, in blissful ignorance of his former life. Until one day, in what he thought was another hallucination, he thought he could see a familiar silhouette in the distance. The figure was holding a book on a cliff at the edge of Jinanin. Saavedra thought it was death come to finally take him, but to his surprise it was Atris who touched the book and linked away. Saavedra was afraid, but eventually made his way towards the cliff and the book. The fog had caused him to have a great fear of the book, but soon he overcame his concerns and opened it, and recognized a linking panel on the first page. Some of Saavedra's memories then came rushing back as he remembered who he was and why he was here. He kept the book and proceeded to write a journal in order to help him dispel the fog and recollect the fragments of his life that he was trying to piece together. His emotions soon manifested itself into anger, rage towards the two sons of death that had trapped him and killed his people and family. He wanted revenge on Atris, who brought the Angels of Chaos and Death to Narayan. He planned on using the book to go to Atris's home and take his life. However, upon warping, he found himself alone in Atris's study on Tumana. He started searching the cabinets and bookshelves. He found some journals of Atris's, and memories kept pouring back into Savedro, with his hatred growing ever stronger. He eventually found a Jananian linking book and used it, knowing he now had a link only he knew was being used between the two ages. He returned a few times in secret to Tamana and found great interest in Atris's journal, detailing his progress with Relishan. He read how Atris was bringing, quote, new life to Dunny with his project, and Savedro made a deep misunderstanding. He believed Atris possessed the ability to revive dead worlds with the art, and so he hatched a plan. He spent the next couple years manipulating the ages of Jananin and planned to hold Atris's precious relation as hostage until Atris agreed to fix Narayan. All the while, he observed Atris's family and saw how despite the absence of the despicable sons, they were happy and in their new home, angering Savedro, who had lost everything because of that family. A family that was, in fact, growing. A few months prior to the completion of Relishan, Catherine and Atris had another child, a daughter named Yisha. It was a happy year for the family, and as such, with the final touches to Relishan being made, Atris wanted to bring an old friend to celebrate what they had allowed to create. Atris had gotten in touch with the stranger upon moving to Tamana, and the two had kept in touch through letters. Atris and Catherine invited the stranger to come to Tamana to introduce them to both Yisha and Relishan. The stranger happily accepted and made their way back to the cleft and then Tamana. Upon arriving, the stranger is quickly acquainted with the family and is introduced to baby Yisha. Before long, Atris eagerly brings the stranger into his study to show them Relishan and to lead them on an expedition there. However, upon entering the study, Saavedro suddenly appears, linking to Tamana. He quickly grabs Relishan and throws a fire marble on the ground, sending Atris's study ablaze. Atris, in his surprise, only can call out, No! Relishan! as the book is taken away back to Jananin, with Saavedro leaving the linking book, anticipating being followed. The book, however, is caught in the fire and only lasts a few moments before being unusable. In those few moments, though, 
The stranger, without thinking, rushes to the book and links to Jananin to give chase. The link is closed and at that moment the stranger is trapped on Jananin. Saavedro, believing that he has lured Atris to his age, goes ahead with his plan. The stranger makes their way through Janani into the central tusk, where through a window he sees Saavedro linked to Narayan, using a linking book that proceeds to lock itself after being used by Saavedro. Upon entering the room, the stranger witnesses a recording left by Saavedro intended for Atris. The recording tells Atris to go through the trials his sons went through on the three ages of Jananin to find murals and hidden messages and then meet him on Narayan. The stranger proceeds to go to the three ages and learn the fundamentals of each that Atris had used to teach his children. On the energy-filled voltaic, the lesson of energy powers future motion was taught. On the brimming with life, Edana, the lesson of nature encourages mutual dependence was taught. And finally, on the eccentric Amateria, the concept of dynamic forces spur change was taught. At each age, the stranger saw Saavedro's various tampering and manipulations, evidence of some puzzles being altered to make them more difficult from years past. Pieces of Saavedro's journal detailing his madness are spread throughout the ages, as well as some painted murals showing the trust and complete betrayal of Cirrus and Akinar towards the Narayan people. After visiting all three ages and returning to Jananin, the linking book to Narayan is now accessible. Upon arriving, the stranger finds themselves in the isolated island, surrounded by an ice shield. They quickly find a linking book that allows one to return to Jananin. Using the lessons taught in each of the ages, the stranger solved the first puzzle and lowered the ice shield. However, this only opened up the way to the balcony, where an outer ice shield still stood. This first puzzle was long solved by Saavedro, but the outer shield eluded him. With access to the balcony, the stranger climbed to the roof of the structure, where there was Saavedro's Tomana book as well, but the stranger needed relation before they could go. Not long before approaching the roof, Saavedro revealed himself, and was mortified to discover that it was not Atris that followed him. He was furious, and told the stranger that they were now trapped in the Jananin Ages with him. If the stranger ever went back to Tamana, Saavedro would follow and attack Atris's family. There must be something missing. The stranger went back downstairs to solve the mystery of the outer shield. They soon found that the device used to operate the outer shield required a solution that involved four lessons, a combination of the first three learned, as well as a final one which neither the stranger nor Saavedro it seemed could recall. But upon looking through one of Atris's journals that the stranger had on hand, the final lesson was discovered. Balanced systems stimulate civilizations. From here, power was restored to release the outer shield, which when dropped, the distant islands of Narayan were brought into view. To Saavedro's shock and disbelief, his people appeared to be still alive in stable portions of the age. Maybe even his family was among them. There was a catch, though. The power could only be dropped to one shield at a time, and mechanisms supplying power to both shields were located inside both domes. This meant that Saavedro would need to trust the stranger to drop the outer barrier so he could leave and go to the rest of Narayan. The stranger couldn't trust Saavedro given his state, but through some rather harsh diplomacy worked out an exchange. If Saavedro gave them release on, they would drop the outer barrier. Upon performing the switch, Saavedro could finally leave the island and return to the Narayan people. With Relishan in hand, the stranger returned to Tomana and returned the book to a relieved Catherine and Atris, who were just finishing putting out the flames within Atris's study. For now, Atris's enemies remained trapped, but none were truly gone, and as the years went on, he would find that the past would continue to catch up to him. While he felt Gen was lost mentally, and couldn't be redeemed in his prison, Atris always felt remorse for what happened to his sons. Maybe if he had raised them better, or grew them up in a better environment, 
or even focused on actually teaching them the art, he wouldn't have had to do what he did. And he and Catherine didn't want to make the same mistakes with their daughter, Yisha. They decided to raise her in Tumana, overseeing her trips to other ages, and being willing to teach her both the Dunny language and the art. Meanwhile, Atrus couldn't stop thinking about his sons, and decided to use the viewer on Rhyme to see if they were at least still alive in their prisons, Spire and Haven. The brothers were indeed making the most of their respective ages. Upon his initial arrival, Cirrus built a bonfire on the tip of Spire before proceeding, where he looked for the Miss Linking book his father must have used. He eventually realized that this age was not the place of wealth he believed and that it was a prison age. His father must have let the book fall into the abyss with the Sea of Clouds. Cirrus begins to explore the rocky terrain, discovering crystalline caverns with minerals of magnificent properties that have incredible scientific potential. A few months into the imprisonment, the stranger arrives on Mist, and Cirrus tries to convince them to be released, which we saw how that turned out. Over the next few years, Cirrus writes a journal and dedicates himself to learning about the crystals and their electromagnetic potential. He is able to construct a means of dissension down the grim cliff sides that could potentially allow him to traverse the area below the Cloud Sea of Spire. Upon doing so, however, he saw that the mountains only continued into a large plasma-like ball of energy below. The mist book was lost, and for the first time since his arrival, Cirrus truly felt trapped. Over the years, Cirrus continues to advance the technology of Spire creating a hovercraft of sorts to explore some nearby islands. He wanted to be sure the age was uninhabited, as Atrus had previously accidentally written a couple natives into intentionally barren ages prior. With no such luck though, Cirrus began to take to sculpting as well, creating vignettes of his memories, while continuing the construction of more and more intricate devices and power sources within Spire. On Haven, Akinar was met with a much more abundant age. There were several species of wild beasts on a mostly jungle-filled island. There was also an abandoned shipwreck to make Linkers believe that they had made it to a wealthy, or at least inhabited age. Similar to Cirrus, he started to look for an accessible mist book, but he realized this was a prison age when he couldn't find a book, and it was further confirmed with the actions involving the stranger. Here, Akinar made no major attempt to locate a missing mist linking book. Atrus could have easily dropped it into a bonfire. In actuality, he swam into the middle of the swamp and used it while letting it sink, thus destroying it. Akinar spent the years fashioning small bases both in the jungle and on the shipwreck. According to his journal, he grew to favor hunting the small beasts and spent most of his time studying their behaviors. In fact, he was even able to befriend the more intelligent Mangri species, something that would allow him to retain his sanity through the 20 years of exile. Meanwhile, Yisha is progressing well in her training, and she is growing into a fine writer, and more importantly, a fine person. Catherine and Atrus grew more remorseful, and began looking at routes to rehabilitate, or at the very least, observe the suns more actively. Atrus began by looking at them remotely more often via the crystal viewer in rhyme, before beginning the thought of entering the ages himself. Upon some convincing from Catherine, Atrus started planning and later began writing additions into the Spire and Haven descriptive books. He wrote linking chambers made mostly of hard Nara stone into the linking points of both Spire and Haven. These were built to allow someone to link into the prison ages with the rest of the age separated by a glass wall. Think of these as similar to a prison's visiting room. It allowed for people to talk from either side and allowed certain objects to be delivered on either side of the glass. Both brothers noticed the construction of these chambers, and for the first time in 20 years, they had confirmation that their father was alive. And soon enough, they each had the opportunity to meet with him once again. At first, only Atrus goes through the portals and meets with his sons. On Spire, Cirrus wants to discuss his accomplishments and advancements made on the age but Atrus only discusses the past actions of the son, who burned the books in his library. He tries to desperately convince both his father and later his mother that he has regrets, but his envy still shows. He believes the only reason Atrus went to such lengths for them to meet was to further flaunt his power of the art, something no matter how intelligent Cirrus is, he will never have. 
He becomes convinced that his only hope now will be to escape. There is a linking book on Spire now, only separated from Cirrus by a Nara and glass wall, which, through his knowledge of molecular vibration and frequencies that he has mastered on this age, he might just be able to break free. Meanwhile in Haven, Akinar wanted to relay his adventures to his father. While he was impressed by the resourcefulness and tenacity of his son, Atrus was worried he had turned his son into a savage. Unlike Cirrus, who was interested in the sciences, Atrus didn't have much to relate to with Akinar. Fortunately, Akinar did appear less hostile and greedy in basic conversation, and was more willing to simply talk with his family. The two's development took a turn when Atrus thought it was time that the two sons finally met Yisha. Both had expressed a certain amount of shock that they had a new sister. Yisha, now about seven years old, was excited to meet her brothers. Cirrus, very frank and to the point, could see how his father was so affectionate towards her. She seemed very bright and observant. Over time, he grew a bit jealous of how it seemed his parents cared about her. This jealousy turned into anger once he learned that she was being taught the art by Atrus, something he had abandoned teaching his sons out of fear of their abuse of the power. In Haven, however, Akinar had grown less bitter in his exile, and instead grew a greater appreciation of life and relations with other species on Haven. He was excited about the prospect of having a sister, and would talk for hours with her about stories that they both had. Often he would try and bring gifts from Haven for her, things ranging from fruit to a necklace of bones that he had made. This was met by mixed reception from his parents. But Yishu was always grateful, and it was clear Akinar cared deeply for her. He honestly couldn't care less whether she was being taught the art or not. Eventually, Cirrus realized that he needed a specific sample of Nara to match the frequency needed to break the linking chamber. He was unable to chip away at the linking chamber to get a piece. However, he recalled that he and his father used to play chess with a set made of Nara, and asked his father if he could bring the set in order to play a few matches. Atrus was happy to oblige, and Cirrus planned to use a couple of the chess pieces for his frequency experiments. Meanwhile, Atrus and Catherine were at an impasse as to what to ultimately do with the brothers, mainly if they finally deserved to be set free. Ultimately, they decided to ask for guidance from the only other person they could trust with the fate of these two, and that was the stranger. Atrus asked for the stranger to come and meet the sons face to face, and to see how they've changed. Catherine, however, would leave Tamana to clear her mind for a few days on Tay. The stranger had been to Tamana a few times since the Savedro incident, and had seen Nisha growing up, but hadn't seen the brothers in the 20 years since they had left them trapped in their prisons. Upon arriving, Atrus first offers to show the current state of Spire and Haven through a crystal viewer, since Atrus had a second one made on Tamana. However, a glitch causes the right crystals to burn out, prompting Atrus to head to Rhyme to fetch replacements. In the meantime, Yisha leads the stranger on a tour through Tamana, showing some recent developments, and Atrus asks the stranger to repair some power systems on Tamana. The stranger does so, but soon after, is knocked out by a mysterious blast. The stranger falls unconscious until a few hours into nightfall. The stranger quickly begins a search for Yisha, but can't find her anywhere in Tamana. Atrus is able to leave a message to the stranger through the viewer, and tells them that he is trapped in an electromagnetic storm on Rhyme. He likely won't be able to link back for about a day. While unable to locate Yisha, the stranger finds an amulet that was being worn by her, which allows the wearer to view an object's specific memories, and by using it, they can catch a glimpse of Yisha running from an unknown individual. At this point, the stranger is able to link to both Spire and Haven, and uncover the pasts of both Cirrus and Akinar. The linking chambers of both ages have been destroyed by an apparent explosion, and neither brother is anywhere to be found on either age. Through the usage of the amulet, the stranger can deduce that Cirrus was successful in destroying the linking chamber, using the frequency generated from his Nara samples. He was able to create a few portable, marble-sized Nara bombs, he would use these to both cause the explosion on Tamana, and then on Haven to free his brother. On Haven, the two had a brief altercation, with the stranger not being able to see any more than that using the amulet. 
After fully exploring the two prison ages, the stranger arrives back onto Mana to witness Akinar link to Serenya using a book in Yisha's room. Yisha had spoken fondly of Serenya and its people, how she enjoyed the spiritual nature of their culture, and their ability to view dreams in a physical form thanks to a particular plant that grows on the age. The amulet that the stranger now held was a gift from one of the Serenians to Yisha. The stranger gives chase to Serenya and finds evidence that the brothers have kidnapped Yisha. They see Akinar run off and eventually run into Anya, a protector of Serenya and friend to both Catherine and Yisha. She says that she hasn't seen Yisha, but takes the stranger's warning seriously and goes to warn the other Serenya protectors that Yisha may be in danger. Anya suggests the stranger visit the memory chamber where the protector's entire past and memories are stored in memory globes. On the way, the stranger witnesses Cirrus harvesting empty memory globes. However, upon being spotted, explodes the harvester with a Nara bomb. The destruction of the harvester will set the Cernians back a bit, but there is a spare harvester near an older memory chamber. It was abandoned after its plant started emitting toxins towards the end of its life cycle. After exploring the age further, the stranger learns that using materials on Serenia, Cirrus has created a device that could remove memories from a host and put them into the empty globes. It seems that the original plan was to remove Atrus's memories of the art to teach to the sons, but they'll apparently have to settle for what Yisha knows. The stranger is taken to the Hall of Spirits, where the protectors have entered a dreamlike state to ask Serenian ancestors and guardians for advice on the whereabouts of Yisha's location. The stranger then proceeds to run into Akinar, who is holding an object called the Life Stone, stolen from the memory chamber. He says he knows it looks bad, but he's stealing it to stop Cirrus, who he claims has gone mad and kidnapped Yisha. He tells the stranger to find Akinar's journal, which details Cirrus's plan. Upon finding it, the journal details that Cirrus is actually planning on swapping memories between himself and Yisha, thereby essentially switching minds, allowing him to pose as Yisha and learn the art. Back at the Hall of Spirits, the protectors reveal that the dream spirits didn't make sense to them and ask the stranger to go in themselves. Upon finding a spirit guide, the stranger goes on a journey to the spiritual world. Inside the dream world, they talk with their guide, who reveals a specific color combination, which at the moment doesn't seem to make sense. After leaving the dream world and the active memory chamber, the stranger heads to the second memory chamber, where behind the entrance he finds Cirrus, who tries to convince the stranger that Akinar has Yisha and will kill her if the stranger doesn't stop him. He said he only destroyed the harvester to prevent Akinar from destroying the memory chamber, as Akinar has gone insane. The stranger already has a hunch as to which of the brothers is telling the truth, but makes their way to the back entrance to the second memory chamber, currently locked. However, the unlock combination was the color code the stranger was given in their dream state, and after inputting the combination, they decide to pursue Cirrus. Inside the memory chamber, they find Cirrus in a steel coffin, comatose, and Yisha tied to a steel chair. At a control panel, there are two levers to pull. Yisha begs the stranger to pull the left, which will release the restraints. As they are about to do this, Akinar runs in with a crossbow and tells the stranger that Cirrus has already gone through with his plan and that this is actually Cirrus in Yisha's body. Yisha calls Akinar crazy and says he's just trying to kill both of them. Akinar refuses and begs the stranger to pull the other lever, which will return memories to their point of origin. Yisha claims that this will kill her, but Akinar insists on doing it before the memory chamber loses power from him removing the life stone. The stranger ultimately trusts Akinar and pulls the right lever. Akinar thanks the stranger while Cirrus has given up his act in Yisha's body and claims that his performance was perfect before falling unconscious. However, something is wrong. The memory chamber begins to tremble as the plant begins to die, and Cirrus nor Yisha have woken up with their memories intact. The stranger once again returns to the dream state, this time in the same memory chamber as Yisha and Cirrus, allowing the stranger to visibly see both of their mental states. Meanwhile, Akinar tries to return the life stone to stall the death of the plant. The stranger's spirit guide shows how Cirrus's mind is still leeching onto some of Yisha's memories. Unlike the stranger or Yisha, who have spirit guides, Cirrus's mind would die in dream alone, so he clings onto Yisha's mind to survive. 
However, if the stranger can sort out the memories of Yisha and Cirrus to their original selves, Cirrus's mind will have nothing to cling on to, allowing Cirrus to be stunned long enough for Yisha to freely make her way back to her body. Upon successfully doing so, the stranger causes Cirrus's mind to drift off into dream and die. Upon waking, the stranger sees Yisha wake up in her chair, where they quickly pull the other lever releasing her. Akinar heads into the room and reveals that he had to manually break the glass of the plant chamber to put the life stone back, giving the stranger enough time to sort out memories. Akinar had ingested enough toxins for it to be fatal, as he is just barely able to make it back to Yisha to see her one last time. He expresses regret for his past actions, but no regrets for the sacrifice he has just made before dying in her lap. Later, Atrus thanks the stranger for saving Isha. He expresses both happiness for his daughter, along with sadness and regret for the deaths of his sons. Both he and Catherine vow to devote themselves to Yisha and provide her with the best possible life she could have. Thank you for checking out this video. If this is your first video of mine that you've seen, then please hit the button at the top to check out my first part in this series. I hope you've enjoyed my videos so far, and please look forward to the final part in this Miss mini-series coming next month. This video primarily covered actual games in the series, all of which are now available on Steam to be played yourself, so please support Cyan's official releases in the franchise by playing through these amazing experiences yourself. Since we covered a lot of in-game events, uh, thank you to the sources of in-game footage that was used in the making of this video. Also, the Book of Dunny was featured in this part, which is the last of the trilogy of Mist novels, which is also included in the Mist Reader collection mentioned in the previous video. So please support the creators and check out that book series if you're interested. As usual, please support the creators and developers of this amazing franchise. Feel free to like and subscribe for more, and be sure to have a good one whenever and wherever. This is Krimic. See you guys next time.